Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambeau channel. A man named Chris Dixon, who was uh, an important player in the Ethereum Free Pass situation of 2018, has blocked me on social media. And uh, what I'm finding here, and we keep finding, it's not, it's not about me. I, I just, I'm, I wanted to point this out to make a broader point, and I keep seeing this, is these, these people that are key players in the Ethereum Free Pass, they're trying to silence the truth. And, and how they go about doing that is pretending like all of the facts that people like attorney John Deaton have been pointing out and arguing, which, by the way, are just facts and video clips of their themselves, their own words, just pointing that out. A lot of times w without opinion, even just putting it out there like that's what they don't want people to see. And so I got to tell you. I, the more you you guys block me that that were involved in this Ethereum free pass stuff, the more I'm going to shout it from the rooftops just to be super duper clear. Because this is some shady stuff. It does not look good. It's not a good look. And so this guy, he blocked me. I've never even talked to him before. I may have mentioned him in previous videos, but uh, I, I didn't... I didn't converse with him even, but he knows that this is one. It's just one. It's, it's And again, it's not all about me. Don't take this the wrong way. But this is one of the platforms on YouTube that is relentless in covering this stuff. And I'm going to keep doing that. Um, and, and he sees that. And so that has to be what happened here. I'm not surprised to see it. And so the, the reason I wanted to point this at, out at the outset of the video is, is just to, to say, look, we're on to them. They know it. They're feeling the heat. And I, I don't know about you guys. I actually, I have a feeling it's probably safe to speak for everybody listening. None of us are going to stop. We're going to keep bringing this because we're on the right side of history. And a lot of these people have, have done things that at a minimum have a strong appearance of uh, impropriety, lacking ethics. And so I'm not going to make any uh, allegations that specifically something was done illegally. But I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. I'm just saying that there should be an independent investigation, which is exactly what attorney John Deaton has been calling for here. And so John Deaton had a number of thoughts to share. And he does talk about this gentleman here. I use that term loosely, Chris Dixon, who uh, is not he's not willing to have open communication. He's, he's just trying to block out people, even if they've never spoken to him before. Just he's trying to silence the message. But I want to be clear at the outset. I do not have a legal or financial background of any kind. I am not offering legal or financial advice, and you definitely should not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say or write. I'm just an enthusiast who enjoys making YouTube videos about crypto-related topics, but just as a hobby and just for fun. And folks, by the way, there's all sorts of actors in the space, including even um, Gary Ginsburg's official Twitter account. They're blocking people within the XRP community. Have you seen this? Like, I, I kid you not. Like, There are people at some of the highest levels of that agency and other um, other other firms closely associated with uh, the SEC and people that were at high levels, especially within the last few years, they're just blocking people. They're not addressing it. They just they want it to go away so badly, but it's not going to. Right. And so here's what attorney John Deaton had to say. <clears throat> How Web3 and the Ether Free Pass was born. Recently, Jack Dorsey, of course, yes, the creator of Twitter, that is the one we're talking about, uh, he was blocked by uh, Mark Andreessen, that's the name, yeah, here we go, Mark Andreessen, over at Jack's observation, over Jack's observation regarding the inherent interests of venture capitalists related to Web3. And, and so Mark Andreessen, if Andreessen sounds familiar, it's the uh, one of the founders of Andreessen Horowitz, a, uh, a venture capital firm. And so uh, he was, he blocked Jack, creator of Twitter, over Jack's observation regarding the inherent interest of venture capital firms related to Web3. And so what is Web3? And here's a quote John Deaton shared. Web3, much like other buzzwords you hear, Bitcoin, NFTs, etc., is based on blockchain technology. And so I'll, I'll break it down like this, and all sorts of people have different definitions. But there's this article that attorney John Deaton shared. And in this if you want to believe this particular article, everybody seems to have different definitions, but uh, Web 1 was the, uh, the initial earliest days of the internet where you could just, uh, you could sort of inter you could not interact with what's on a page, but you could load a page up and view its contents. And then around 1999, they state here, Web 2 um, was created when you could interact. So you could think back then, anybody that was alive in 1999, you remember, for instance, Flash, remember Flash when that was a thing, which has now been phased out. But uh, it offered, you know, some of the first opportunities to interact with, with the web page. So that's what they're talking about. So they're calling that web too. Um, now, uh, I see that it goes, it depends on who you ask. Because when I entered crypto in 2017, uh, people with it and Ripple were calling web two the internet of value. Like that was web two. So 
There's there's no single authority that gets to choose this. It's more like people say stuff, and then whatever society latches onto, that's just going to be what it becomes. So right now, it's not completely clear, to be honest with you. And then Web3, what's Web3? <clears throat> well, it's the same as Web2, except for decentralized, with the purpose behind that being uh, you can have autonomy behind your own identity and a number of other things. Uh, so it would uh, make censorship a thing of the past effect. Like that's that's what that's the idea anyway behind behind Web3, just decentralized blockchain technology. And um, it could take a long time to come to fruition, but that's what people are attempting to develop and have adopted, right? So anyway, just in a nutshell. So now you know what Web3 is alleged to be, at least according to that article, which isn't wacky or anything, but um, even Brad Garlinghouse, he had a Twitter thread recently and I shared it and he's like, and he mentioned Web3 and he's like, whatever any of you think it is, so, something to that effect, it's like, whatever that means to you folks listening or something or, or reading. Um, and I'm paraphrasing there, but even Brad Garlinghouse is like, you made it clear. It's like, nobody knows what the hell it is because everybody has a different definition of it. But anyway, let me continue with what John Deaton had to share. Um, this is a quote from the piece. As of now, most of it is based on the Ethereum blockchain. What we're talking about what through here, based on the Ethereum blockchain. In fact, Ethereum co-founder Gavin Wood first coined the term Web3 in 2014. He now runs the Web3 Foundation. Also in 2014, um, Gavin Wood, Vitalik Buterin, Joseph Lubin, and uh, Stephen Naryoff, and others orchestrated the world's first ICO, which of course was Ether. In 2017, Bill Hinman, as director of corporation finance, arranged a meeting with Joe Lubin and Consensus. That meeting took place December 13th, 2017. The initial meeting between Hinman and Lubin occurred at the height of the ICO craze, following Ether's successful crowd sale model. But Hinman and the Lubin slash consensus meeting wasn't about Ethereum's ICO. Instead, it was the beginning of a very mutually beneficial alliance. Now, alliance isn't my word. The next day, Matt Corva, general counsel of consensus, publicly stated that consensus and the Brooklyn Project was building an alliance with the SEC. Jay Clayton's law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell, represented Lubin and Consensus when they met with Henman in December of 2017. The following month, on January 25th, 2018, SEC Chairman Clayton met with Andreessen Horowitz's Chris Dixon, and this is right here, he, this guy's blocked me, never talks it in my entire life, but he saw that I was sharing facts and he doesn't want you to know the facts. And so he blocked me. He doesn't want me to see. As if I didn't even need to look at his profile for any of this anyway. He's just, he's clearly spiteful. And so I blocked him back. But, you know, what are you going to do? Like, that's my policy. If somebody blocks me and I catch it, I just block him back. That's it. You know, I think fair is fair, right? But uh, that's what this guy did. Never talked to him my entire life. And he's got, I think he's got, it shows at the end, um, John Deaton shares a, a screen grab of his profile. And I think the guy has like over 700,000 followers. And, and this is what he's doing. So anyway, the following month, on January 25th, 2018, SEC Chairman Clayton met with Andreessen Horowitz's Chris Dixon and instructed Dixon to get together with select industry players and submit a proposal of how the SEC should proceed with digital assets. Now, how do we know all of this? Well, Crypto Law US, and of course, that's John Deaton's website, CryptoLaw.us. Uh, well, it's crypto-law.us, um, has assembled a video library of the insiders who participated in the free pass. Lowell Ness of Perkins Coie revealed something, quote, that not a lot of people know, end quote. A meeting between Jay Clayton and Andreessen Horowitz played a central role in later events. Ness has said that after appearing at a Stanford University event in January 2018, Clayton, quote, made his way over to see Anderson the next morning, and he invited Chris Dixon to round up the industry players, end quote, and asked, quote, for a proposal on where to go from here, end quote. Really grinds my gears, folks. John continues. But which industry players did Chris Dixon round up? XRP and the XRP Ledger was created in 2012 by Jed McCaleb, David Schwartz and Arthur Brito. XRP was the second crypto asset ever created after Bitcoin. In January 2018, XRP was the second largest crypto asset by market cap, not Ethereum. Now, certainly, the second largest crypto asset 
would be represented in this industry group. But according to Charles Gasparino and Eleanor Terrett's reporting, of course, they're with Fox Business Network, uh, Ripple was not invited by Dixon to be a part of this industry group. We know Lowell Ness was the lead attorney writing the memo. According to Ness, he had been re representing Anderson Horowitz, quote, on all their crypto investments since the beginning. And, quote, he got the chance to write all that stuff, end quote. And that's what Ness said. The, uh, the general reception from the SEC when those meetings began were, quote, really positive, end quote. And he said, quote, it was an interesting dichotomy between their public-facing, incredibly vituperative statements that they were making and this interesting welcome that we got privately. So who exactly was represented in this industry group and received such a warm reception by the SEC. Well, we know several law firms were involved, but who exactly did they represent? Ness stated he bought in a cup, brought in a couple other law firms to help, but did anyone represent a non-Ethereum crypto project? <gasps> now, that's a good question, don't you think, folks? Did any of them represent a non-Ethereum crypto project? And when you read the memo and Safe Harbor proposal, only one is mentioned. Why would Ether be the only crypto or digital asset referenced in providing a safe harbor? Once again, were all the industry players that Chris Dixon rounded up part of that Ether ecosystem? These questions need to be answered. And of course, the questions must first be asked. Yeah, that's exactly what let me pause. That's exactly what Chris Chris Dixon doesn't want. When they start acting like this and they get all shifty and they, they block you out and they, they're not willing to talk about it, doesn't that make them look like they may have done something not quite right? Isn't that kind of a bad look? Because that's what I start to think. This is not people people that aren't guilty don't act like this. Right? And so again, I don't know for sure if they did anything if he did anything illegal, any of them. But I'm just saying it makes me skeptical, right? I think that's pretty damn reasonable. This is not normal adult behavior, right? Like going to the trouble of blocking out some dude on the internet named Moon Lambo who you've never talked to. Is, is that what you do when you haven't done anything wrong? Is that a thing that you do? And it's not just, again, it's not just me. It's other YouTubers. It's other XRP community members. All sorts of people within the ecosystem. Not just me. I'm just telling you part of my story. Anyway, John continues. Why wasn't XRP represented? Before claiming Ether is so different, consider how Vitalik described Ether's ICO, insisting it would be, quote, an opportunity for anyone to purchase Ether, uh, end quote, which he said was a, quote, currency inside the Ethereum system, sort of like the XRP and Ripple, end quote. And he's got a video. I'm not going to play the video, but uh, it's silently playing on your screen there. John continues. Some people attempt to dismiss the Ether free pass as a conspiracy theory, yet they can't refute what we've assembled because all we've done is played their own interviews or speeches and made a timeline. People who were intimately involved have spoken out and recognized the truth. Now, pause. Isn't that freaking powerful and isn't that the damn truth? John Deaton has gone to great, great lengths to put together, and there are obviously a lot of other, as we're calling them now, uh, uh, Twitter sleuths who have been finding all of this fantastic information. So it's a team effort for sure. John Deaton, though, he, he's put this together on his crypto law website. And isn't it the case that we're just, hey, here's their own words. Why are they getting, why are they getting so fussy about it? It's just that we put a timeline of their words, their videos. What is the freaking problem here? Might we be on to something? Might this be incredibly unfair to XRP holders? Hmm. Questions, questions, folks. John Deaton continues. Joseph Grunfest acted as a SC, an SEC liaison for Stephen Narioff, who was the self-described architect of the Ether ICO. Grunfest isn't a conspiracy theorist, nor is he against Ether. He has called into question Clayton and others' motives in bringing the case against, uh, against XRP. Even people who were part of the industry group chosen by Chris Dixon and Lowell Ness have commented, the Ether free pass makes no logical or legal sense. And then he writes, I'm not going to play the video, but he writes, watch the video below. And I've talked about this video clip before. Watch the video below and listen to Nancy, Nancy Wajtaz, I'm not sure if that's how you say her name, and Wendy Moore discuss how odd it was for Henman to give Ether the pass. Yeah, because uh, Nancy in particular, she's the one in the middle with the mic, uh, she argued that Ethereum... 
at the time of the, the, the video clip anyway, which is October 2018, she said, uh, does it make sense? Because uh, she's like, I don't think Ethereum is decentralized. That That's her position as of 2018 in October. Anyway, John continues, Nancy watched us disagreed with, the, with Hinman that Ether was sufficiently decentralized to not be a security. She said, according to Hinman's speech, any project that does a little better than Ether is golden. And co-panelist Winnie Moore of Perkins Cooey adds, then why isn't Ripple? Good question again. These are people who helped get the free pass. There's no conspiracy here, just plain old facts. Watchtas herself criticized Hinman's actions. Here's a quote. There is no question. Ethereum violated the law and the SEC's view when it issued its tokens. End quote. <laughs> Unquestionably true. They hate this, though. Why do you think? Why do you think people in the XRP community are getting blocked by these folks? John continues. Why did Hinman do it? He collected $15 million from his law firm, a member of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, or EEA for short, while at the SEC. Lowell Ness, Perkins Cooey, is also a core member of the EEA. As stated, Lubin and Consensus was represented by Clayton's firm Sullivan and Cromwell. Sullivan and Cromwell brokered the deal of Consensus buying J.P. Morgan's Quorum, a direct competitor of Ripple. Folks, do you see how incestuous this is? I, that's why, I, I, again, I, I'm not going to be so bold as to, to make a, some sort of legal claim here. But how could there be this many coincidences? And, and all propping up Ethereum. And all of these people. It, it doesn't pass the smell test, folks. John continues. The Quorum slash JP Morgan coin deal was announced four months before the lawsuit against Ripple and XRP was filed, as most senior SEC officials behind the lawsuit left the SEC. Two months before the lawsuit, One River makes a $1 billion bet on Bitcoin and Ether. Within weeks of leaving the SEC, Clayton goes to One River, Henman unretired and returned to his EEA law firm. The director of enforcement, Mark Berger, joined Henman and the EEA at Simpson Thatcher. We learned that Henman's Ether free pass speech closely followed the Lowell Ness Perkins Cooey memo. And after collecting $15 million from Simpson Thatcher, Hinman became a partner with Chris Dixon at Anderson's $2.2 billion crypto fund, which is heavily invested in Bitcoin and Ether. <gasps> Shocker, right? Oh my, can you believe this? Unbelievable, right? <laughs> can you believe this? And then John wraps up by stating, finally, it's ironic that people who conspired to get a free pass are calling those exposing the truth with facts conspiracy theorists. <laughs> Isn't that rich? They might claim Andreessen Horowitz also invested in Ripple, attempting to deflect, but notice they don't have XRP in their Twitter handle. No kidding. And this is where he, he shared that image I was talking about. So like, in, in, as far as investing in Ripple, but here's the thing, there's lots of people within these firms uh, it's like sometimes in big firms, the left hand doesn't know what the hell the right hand's doing. I don't know who was in charge of that, but what about all the Ethereum stuff? Hmm? I'm pretty curious about that. So anyway, going to keep screaming this from the rooftops. You guys out there on the ETH side uh, that uh, that made all this happen back in 2018 in, a, in what appears to be a very shady fashion. You can block me all you want. I'm just going to, it's just going to inspire me to talk further about it. You're, just, you're not going to get me to stop talking about publicly available information. Like I'm just going to keep covering what's publicly available. That, I'm just going to do it. And uh, if you don't like it, you can suck on an entire bag of eggplant emojis for all I care, because I just don't give a damn. I'm not a financial advisor. You should not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say are right. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon, Lambo.